Helen Saunders was a founder member of the Vorticist group in 1914. She was a cousin of my grandmother, and I knew her, as well as her mother and sister, during my childhood. And I'm now the guardian of a certain amount of stuff that has come down through the family. Vorticism was a movement developed in London in response to Cubism in France and Futurism in Italy, and it was spearheaded by an artist called Wyndham Lewis. Lewis was also a writer, and he was largely responsible for the Vorticist periodical Blast, the first issue of which, in 1914, contained a Vorticist manifesto. And Helen Sanders was among the 11 signatories of the manifesto. The idea of Vorticism was to develop an art that responded to the modern industrial urban environment. And so they wanted to make art that was, you know, sort of dealt with the hard surfaces and geometry rather than with sort of natural forms. At the time, when one looks at the work, it becomes clear that all of the Vorticists, you know, very much had their own ideas and their own voice. And this was true of Helen Sanders, as well as all the other members of the group. And, you know, I think one of the interesting things about Helen is that, you know, her vorticist, even her vorticist work, which is obviously, you know, kind of hard edge and to do with, you know, the mechanical modern life, it always has feeling in it. And, you know, there's this kind of, there's this dual thing of, you know, sort of being extremely interested in vorticist geometric language and at the same time wanting to express emotion, which uh, I think more, perhaps more than any of the other vorticists, her work has this, this double streak. This is Helen's copy, slightly incomplete, of a volume by the Ovid Press of facsimile of Gilbert Brzezka's drawings. Helen was later to say in a letter that she considered Godier probably the most considerable artist amongst us, meaning the Vorticists. And Godier was a French artist, very young, sculptor, who had was had joined the Vorticist group, but was killed in action in, I think, 1914 or the beginning of 1915. I presume that the one that isn't here was pinned up by Helen on her studio walls. I think she was definitely influenced by him in her drawings, and, you know, his, his drawings very free and very spare. And I think it probably gave her confidence to... Um, draw using very few lines and being prepared to accept the first, the first version. These are works on paper that we haven't had framed. None of them signed, none of them dated. And this is a, a version of Tintagel. And I wonder whether she did the watercolour possibly on the spot and then went over the outlines afterwards in black. But I don't know. It's uh, interesting, you know, her way of working. I think she had two ways of working generally. And when she did still lives like this, she was probably in front of the objects. And when she did landscapes, I think she quite often did a very quick study in front of the landscape and then painted them at home afterwards, worked on, or in her, I mean, in her studio. This one might be an on-the-spot one, but I'm not sure. So there are only a couple of sketchbooks surviving, and I'm sure she would have had, you know, kept, always had one on the go. And of course, like all her work, they're undated. They contain drawings of people, including her friend Blanche. And this is interesting because uh, Blanche is sitting in the same chair there as in that um, study for a portrait. I think she's, there's always a very strong interest in the structure, interest in the structure of things, or well, very often there is. You know, it's, it's not a kind of illustrative approach. Um, perhaps she's less interested in the surfaces of the objects and more interested 
in the way, you know, in, in, in the shape they are. I mean, you can see in, you know, something, you know, something like this. I mean, there is this sort of absolute kind of sense of underlying geometry. And that one, that one very strongly. So I think it was there to a greater ex or lesser extent going on in her mind. In the catalogue, I've argued that Rosa Waugh lay the grounds with her theory of natural perspective um, in the sense that, you know, what she was, she was talking about one's experience of space rather than a sort of strict geometrical rule of recession towards a single vanishing point. So I think, I think that Helen felt that she was, you know, in order to make an interesting composition, there was nothing wrong with distorting what, you know, distorting the perspective that you would get if you took a photograph of it 